Hi, I'm Dan Cordopassi. Today I'm reviewing an HS Scale SD45 locomotive from Scale Trains. My model is decorated and detailed for Southern Pacific. This model is available in two versions. The factory direct price for the DCC Ready version is $184.99. I paid $274.99 for my DCC and sound equipped model direct from Scale Trains. We'll start the model at 100 possible points. The engine comes in a sturdy cardboard box with foam lining. Inside is an operator's manual with explanations of how the DCC function keys are set up, lubrication instructions, and other information. A two-piece plastic cradle protects the model. Foam inserts protect the handrails. The lowermost step in the rear on the engineer's side is missing on my model. Thankfully, the step is in the box. One corner of the plow is also damaged. I don't think a model this expensive should arrive with damaged parts, so I'm taking five points. An alternate dynamic brake section without the vent is included in the box. Despite the damage, I still think this is an excellent box that should do a good job protecting the model for storage and transport. This SD45 from Scale Trains represents a unit from Southern Pacific's initial order for 45 SD45 units that were delivered in 1966. These locomotives were about as close to stock EMD units as SP had, and they didn't have as many SP features as on some later orders. Spotting features of these units include a two-piece engineer's front window, ratchet-style brake on the fireman's side of the short hood, SP light package on the front only, and low-mounted brake cylinders. Some of the SD45s in this series lasted into the 1980s. A few were rebuilt into SD45R units and renumbered into the 7400 series. Since I opted for an unnumbered unit, I'm basing my analysis on photos and roster information for the entire class of locomotives, which carried numbers 8800 through 8844. Overall, the model matches photos pretty well. The model has early style uncoupling levers without the vertical extension so that they can be pulled more easily by a crew member standing on the steps behind the coupler. Looking at the photos, most units had this modification by 1980. Some, though not all of the units, also had their class lights plated over by the 1980s. The model as it comes out of the box best represents the class as it appeared in the 1960s and 1970s. While it's great that scale trains included the extra part, I could not find any photo evidence that any of the units in this series had the alternate dynamic brake section without the vent. My unit has no grab irons on the front of the short hood. I assume that this was intended to make it easier to apply decals. A pair of painted grab irons are included in the box. From what I've been able to determine, the units in this class were delivered with numbers on the nose. Many of them later had SP initials applied, like on this scale train's tunnel motor. I even found a couple of photos of weathered units with both SP initials and ghost-like unit numbers appearing under flaking red paint. Comparing the model to photos, the red paint on the rear of the long hood doesn't wrap around the ends as far as it should. The red should extend to about here. This would be difficult to fix, so I'm taking five points. Looking at photos, the MU stands with dual connectors on the ends on the model are only correct for some of the units in this class. In most of the photos I found, these units had a single connector. The paint on the model is opaque and thin enough to allow all of the great detail on the body to show through. The red paint appears to have been applied over the gray and is a little thicker, though not enough to soften the details much. The markings are crisp and I couldn't find any voids. All of the tiny stencils are legible with magnification. The detail is really good. On the fireman's side, the front truck has a speed recorder cable and brake lines. The handrails are made of a flexible plastic and most of the stanchions are straight. These seem less prone to popping loose compared to the ones on my scale train's tunnel motors. In front, the model has separately applied windshield wipers and a freestanding grab iron on top of the short hood. The number boards have no numbers in them, which is to be expected on an unnumbered unit. Additional glazing for the front number boards is included in the box. The oscillating light has shields to keep glare out of the cab. On the pilot, the model has uncoupling levers, hoses, and a plow with freestanding grab irons. I was not able to find a photo of a real unit in this series with this exact plow on it, though it appears to be close to the prototype. Since not every unit I looked at had the exact same plow, I'm giving the model the benefit of the doubt here. The drop steps are somewhat flexible and look like they could be raised into the up position, however I was hesitant to try it on my model since the parts seem pretty fragile. On the cab the vents are correctly positioned. The model has prototypical armrests, photo etched sunshades, and wind deflectors. The cab side windows are positionable, though I found them very difficult to move. 
Inside the cab has a full interior. The standard EMD battery box arrangement is correct for many of SP's non-rebuilt SD45s, as are the standard EMD jacking pads. In back, the model has the standard EMD headlight, which is correct for this series of units. There are no number boards in the rear, which is also correct. The rear has freestanding grab irons. Aside from the lack of a plow, the rear end pilot details are similar to the front. The box beam across the bottom is correct for at least some of the units in this series. I should note that some of SP's SD45s from later orders had rear end plows. On the cab roof, the horn, bell, and antenna appear to be in the correct places. The turbo exhaust and the small grill on the inertial filter hatch are photo etched. The dynamic brake and radiator fans also have see-through photo etched grills. Looking at the bottom of the extra dynamic brake assembly, you can see how the blades are attached to the roof. The roof also has delicate lift rings and a separately applied curved rear grab iron. The dynamic brake section can be removed pretty easily, so be careful not to pick the model up in that area. If you have a DCC ready model, the decoder goes right under the dynamic brake section. The model is set up for a 21 pin plug-in decoder. You could also swap in the alternate dynamic brake section if you wanted to. Under the sill there is enough plumbing to satisfy most detail conscious modelers. The engine has metal wheels. All of the axles are powered and all the wheels pick up current. The model has scale trains knuckle couplers on both ends. The coupler in front is very low so I'm taking 5 points. The coupler in the rear is also low. All the wheels are engaged according to the NMRA standards gauge. There is no body wobble. The engine weighs 19.3 ounces. Peak drawbar pull came out at 4 ounces even. An average HO scale diesel pulls about 2.5 ounces, so this is a strong engine. I'm running the model on DCC. I haven't changed any of the default decoder settings. The engine is equipped with an ESU Loke Sound 5 series sound decoder. F8 turns on the sound as well as the number boards and ground lights. F0 turns on the headlight, which is directional. The front headlight is on in the forward direction, and the rear headlight is on when the engine is in reverse. F7 turns on the oscillating light. F5 cycles the class lights. They can be white, green, red, or off. The rear class lights operate in concert with the front ones. F14 turns on the emergency light, which also turns off the other lights. F1 rings the bell. F2 sounds the horn. The length of the toot depends on how long the key is held down. According to the manual, F10 is supposed to be an independent brake that will bring the model to a stop, though on my model it does nothing but make a noise. This is likely a programming error and most likely could be fixed by tweaking the decoder settings. Still, I don't think reprogramming the decoder should be necessary on a model this expensive, so I'm taking 5 points. F4 puts the engine in dynamic brake mode. F9 activates the drive hold feature. This could be used to simulate a heavy train starting on a grade. Or a locomotive that is coasting. The locomotive runs very smoothly. With the sound off it's pretty quiet. The model has a capacitor circuit to keep it running for a few seconds if it loses track power. The couplers are very low on my model and I don't really like the scale trains couplers anyway. I'm going to replace mine with Katie Whisker couplers. I'll start by removing the front coupler box. Unfortunately I had to take it out in pieces as it won't slip past the plow assembled. The rear coupler was much easier to extract. I won't need the coupler centering springs, so I'm taking them out. This is a KD-158 scale coupler. It drops right into the scale train's draft gear box. When reinstalling couplers on a model like this, it's good to use a tool to move the uncoupling lever out of the way so it doesn't get caught between the draft gear box and the pilot. After putting the new couplers on the engine, they're still down in the weeds. With the couplers off the model again, the shell can be removed by carefully pulling it upward. To make it easier to figure out what's going on, my first thought was to try to put the couplers on the chassis without the shell. Unfortunately, the screws actually go into the shell itself, passing through the metal pads at each end of the engine. 
Using the rear of the height gauge, it looks like the metal pads on the chassis are at the correct height. The screw mounts on the shell don't stick down below the metal pads, so that can't be the issue. My next thought was that there might be interference between the opening in the pilot and the raised area on the front of the draft gear box. I'm going to file the back of this raised area to remove some material. The place where the paint is scraped off shows where I'm filing. Unfortunately, doing that didn't do the trick. I ended up having to file the top of the coupler box down. Even though the coupler mounting pads checked out, I'm also filing those to help get the coupler up to where it needs to be. After doing all that, the couplers are still a hair low. I'll cut a small strip of 10,000 styrene to use as a shim, then glue it inside the bottom of the coupler box to raise the coupler slightly. I also filed the detail on the bottom of the front draft gear box a little to make it easier to get past the plow. Finally, now the couplers are correct. I'm almost tempted to take another five points here because this was so much work. I'll use a small amount of CA glue applied with a piece of scrap wire to reattach the rear step. To fix the plow, I'll coax the broken piece back into position and secure it with some liquid styrene cement. Let's see what we've got. The engine arrived with damaged parts, so I took five points in the packaging category. The rear end paint doesn't extend far enough down the long hood, so I took five points in the prototype accuracy category. The model had two low couplers and the brake function didn't operate, so I took 15 points in the standards and operation category. That leaves us with 75 out of 100 possible points, which would be a C on a report card. This is a nicely detailed good running model that unfortunately has a few issues, so I'm giving it a yellow signal. In spite of its flaws, I think overall scale trains did a pretty good job on this engine. If you need some 1970s era Southern Pacific motive power for your layout, then I think you might like it.